I, I, I did a dumb rainbow capitalism at the store yesterday and I bought the gay beer. <laughs> I, w- I wanted beer and I was like, you know what? I'm going to get the rip gay it kind. Rip it. Yeah. rip it, rip it. It's not as bad as I thought it would be. Bud Light's good. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> macro brews like, are macro for a reason. Yeah, like it's I like fine. light beer too. Like I like Pilsners and, and stuff like this. So I'm like, this is fine. IPAs are gross. I hate IPAs. If you like IPAs, fuck you. It's the same industry <laughs> that tries to sell you on bed frames and and other shit you don't need. Yeah, is it the gay beer or is it the trans beer? Have we is this is about a trans lady who was holding it and they got mad, right? Something like Yes, that. she's trans. Yes, she's homophobic. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the trans beer, but not the gay beer. Yeah, no. Oh. <laughs> the homophobic trans the homophobic, mascot for Bud Light. Happy Pride, baby. I'm just an, I'm a thinking computer, a learning machine. My pronouns are he, him. I'm Sadie, otherwise known as Emmerich. My pronouns are they, them. <laughs> and I'm Jay. I'm a palindrome that's numerically significant. And my pronouns are he, him. And we're all goths. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm bringing in some industrial music today. You got um, some coil. You got, you got some Neubauten. No, nah, I got it. I got it. So we're, we're like, going to do movie me. night. We're doing, <laughs> we're doing movie night, but we're going to talk about desk set because that's in the title of the episode. But first, we have a new segment. Mota Museum. Keep Mota weird, everybody. Discourse is happening about museums and... Um, it's all based around like one article and I can't find anything else. So it's uh, early days. We really got on the train for this. I've seen, uh, I saw some tweets this morning kind of like, okay, yes, there is nuance. Yes. People, people kind of walking back a little bit like, God okay, forbid. yeah. Okay. There, okay. Yes. There are 50 unrepatriated indigenous remains. Okay. Yes. That is important <laughs> to deal with. Okay. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> But keep motor weird, guys. So it is our our sacred <laughs> duty as goth librarians. Yes, uh, we are the only ones equipped to discuss this issue. Mm-hmm. Totally not indigenous people at all. No, <laughs> goth, goths v librarians. Yeah, and we're um, we're both. <laughs> what was it? Someone said me, me, mean goths versus librarian mean goth people. Uh, people are really uh, fucking spouting off about this. It's really fun. No, what it is is it's it's cringe goth Gen X people versus people with ethics is is Yikes. what this actually is. Mm. <laughs> there goes half our lith- listenership. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Gen X goths. <laughs> Get out of here, Patton Oswalt. <laughs> I mean. Well, he went to William and Mary, so as a fellow alum, I can tell him to go fuck off, and it's fine. Um, Todd <laughs> I'm Howard sure he's as fine well. Now. Yeah, Todd, Patton's fine. Uh, he's a cool guy. Come but, on the show. Um, yeah, we should. The Motor Museum is going to be all about health and wellness and being alive now, and not an Atlas Obscura article made uh, made flesh. And all the goths in the world are mad about it. Although I, I, there's my whole thing about this article is the part where it says "not death" is not in quotes. Right. Some of the things that are attributed to the leadership are the parts that are not in quotes in the article. And this happens at like very specific points in the article mm-hmm. several times where I'm like, no, this is where I want them to comment. I want to know actually like what the leadership is thinking on this specific point. And that's always the point where they couldn't get a comment. Yeah, because like it got I got the sense that the that they were uncomfortable with it kind of being open to the public and that like if it when it was just for physicians they didn't need to actually do their job as a museum and do like curatorial statements and put context you could just have body parts laying around and physicians and like students could come in and be like oh okay i'm learning and not the plebes the unwashed public who Mm -hmm. just like cool dead things because that's human nature we like oddities right and i think there's a way to do that ethically you know, repatriate the indigenous remains, but 
like they kept saying just human remains in this and that they were removing anything that was the like human remains from online and no one could look at the human remains. And I'm like, that's your whole museum basically. But like the display of human remains in and of itself is not unethical is the thing here. And I think they're conflating people being rightfully upset about the um, indigenous remains that they have not repatriated, as well as some of the other examples of remains where the wishes of the person were not respected by the fact of them being in that museum, like the the person who wished to, their remains to be at sea so that their body couldn't be studied like scientifically. That is all valid criticism. But I feel like they're taking that and just going, oh, no human remains, getting rid of it. We don't want to be canceled because this is actually fear mongering about cancel culture is what this all is. Oh, well, we're so afraid of being canceled that we're being forced to do all of this stuff by the the woke left cancel mob. And it's like, ah. I I wonder no. though if, if it's <laughs> if it's not just the the low the woke left can't like cancel mob because like the thing that stood out to me was the quote that was like it's very disrespectful and dis- disturbing that there are fetuses in jars, right? And I'm like, that sounds like uh, uh, that sounds like a Republican. Like, yeah, I'm going to stand on a street corner and show you pictures of things that aren't actually human babies and claim they are. But like, God forbid, you actually put some donated pe- donated fetuses where somebody can see, you know, right? Like the because, person like, who donated it as a way to like give it context meaning, and purpose yeah. and meaning to this experience that happened to them so that people could learn from it. Like, and also yeah. that's, that's your fucking job as someone who works in a museum is to give fucking curatorial statements and context. That's your fucking job. You just don't put shit on a display and go, here you go. Like, yeah, this isn't Ripley's <laughs> unbelievable. Like, or- this is not <laughs> Ripley's. It's not supposed to be. You you work in a museum. Your whole fucking job as a museum person is like, give context to this shit. That's what you do. Well, I I, yeah, and like also gay beer and be mad. (laughs) What Justin was saying in in like in the chat earlier, like I I can kind of see both sides of this. Like I can see them being like, we want to be more than an oddity museum. We want to go back more towards like the medical roots of things instead of just being here for things people to gawk at. Which like whatever, that's fine if that's your thing. Like absolutely, there's nothing wrong with gawking have you know having things to gawk at right but yeah. but again some of the comments from people who didn't want it closed sounded very much like i've seen this happen with friends groups before where a library will something will happen with a library and it'll be actually moving it forward and then the friends group is like we cannot allow this to happen and we are the backbone of this library and we're like what about like you know all of the people that spend 50 or you know 40 to 50 hours a week here and like think that this is actually going to be a really good change for their uh, their environment. Yeah, what about goth that? Democracy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and just like you know, it's it's the people don't like change thing. Right. So therefore, if they don't like the change that's happening, it's destroying the soul of whatever the thing is. And I, I feel like there's just a lot. There's a lot going on here. Yeah. Like I think yeah. it's a mistake to move it away from the like cool, like weird death. You know, I think it's a mistake to move it away from that uh, of it being the sort of like let's learn about all of these like oddities around like the human body and death and all this stuff because it's like it to see that in the human body like normalizes it like Mm -hmm. oh we have variants in our bodies and that's like it's cool to see and it like makes you face your own mortality which is always a good thing getting buddhist about this right Mm. like it's good for that to be normalized could there be a way that that changes going forward that does move it in a good direction? Absolutely. I think moving it away from being about, quote, death and towards, quote, health, I think that's stupid, <laughs> but quite frankly, because they are right that that's losing a revenue stream, like to be capitalist about it, like that's losing a revenue stream. You're not going to get Atlas Obscure articles written about you if you're about wellness and yoga and shit, but- yep, There's enough of that shit going around, right? Yeah, like there's a way that they could go forward respectfully while keeping the sort of soul of what everyone likes this museum to be without being insensitive and without just being Ripley's, believe it or not, is my take. Yeah, well, what what Sadie was saying about the people who are there like all the time, a lot of the people quoted was like a board member, a fellow assistant director on a movie that they were screening, like not people who work there full time. 
Because a lot of those people quit. <laughs> well, <laughs> eight out of 50. I mean, th- so I put that it's under a lot, genuine. But... It's a lot. I put it under genuine problems. So like yeah. the, the leadership is doing stuff quickly and not explaining it. And that seems uh, and they, they seem very reactive and risk averse, which is genuine like leadership problem. Like, yeah, it's the risk aversion thing. Yeah. Not explaining your decisions is bad leadership. Like it's it's yeah. what I call like follow ship. Like you're like, well, you know, the board said I have to do this. So now I do it. And it's, you know, it's like a university president. Like they just wait for the governor to tell them what to do. Yeah. And so it's, you know, you're like, okay, well, what's your job then? So and, and it's, like a it's staff, their job to explain shit. Yeah. Well, in a staff exodus, I think is kind of normal after a change in leadership in a lot of ways too. Yeah. Like either because the, the leadership is, is bad and people are bailing because they don't want to work there anymore, or maybe the staff were bad and the leadership is good now. <laughs> Getting, you know, helping remove some people that probably shouldn't have been there anymore. Like I've seen it both ways. So like. Yeah. Buying out retirements. Yeah. Exactly. Like the very fact that people are leaving within a certain period of time of getting new leadership, it indicates nothing about the actual issue of the article to begin with. It could be for any other reason, right? That's fair. It could also just be like bad timing. Yeah. It, yeah, it can just happen. Like yeah. it's only it's not a statistically significant number of people. Like it's 8 out of it's 50 people. Like it, it happens. Like Yeah. But yeah, there's some stuff that just seems very normal and sensible like um taking down YouTube videos and being like we're going to review them before. And it's like it sounds like they're deleted, but a lot of it could just be not public. Yeah, it sounds like they're and they might just be saying, oh, they're under review just to cover their asses and not get people. Yeah, it could be either way. But I I think it is sensible to because of all of the human remains that are on display right now, maybe they don't know which ones are like the unrepatriated ones or the ones that like maybe what it sounds like is they have no clue. (laughs) Right. And so in that instance, it makes sense then that they would take things down to review them temporarily. I think the mistake would be to write off showing all human remains altogether just because they think that it's insensitive across the board. Yeah, which isn't a thing they said. That was a thing the article speculated. Yeah. But viewers may not see any pictures of human remains in this database, unlike the interactive online exhibit. That's pure speculation. That's like not a quote. Oh, I thought it, um, the may not as, as in will not, like, right. Will not. I read yeah. it like, I read that sentence like four times before I got what they were saying. Oh, but it was, okay. it's speculation and not, it's not a definitive, but you, you're me, you're yeah. reading it as might not. Yeah. Instead of will not. Yeah. Gotcha. And also building like a database of images that you build exhibits on top of. That's, that's good. what I would do. Yeah. That's what I have done at my job. Get an Omeka thing going. Yeah, it it sounds basically like they're building an Omeka as a catalog, and then they'll build exhibits on top of it. Which sounds really reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we should do. And that also, it sounds like they don't know the provenance of anything, which is like real, real problem for museums all the time. Like no one knows where shit comes from. Which I think is a good opportunity for openly talking about that. Like I, I don't like... Yeah, they fucked up the communication. Yeah, they should repatriate what they know that they can repatriate. And otherwise, I think they should do something in their curation and their statements and their displays and their exhibits that talks about we don't know X, Y, Z. So instead of um, like I talk about this, like with cataloging, instead of um, the politics of correction. Right. So instead of correcting, like erasing and obfuscating reckoning with and being open about it and actually talking about it because that in and of itself is really educational um, and encourages viewers or visitors of the museum to think about, oh, you know, like the history and the legacy of the things that they're looking at and what that means in like political context and stuff. Like that's what I would do. Um, But I tend to not be a fan of correction as a politic just because of how often it's used to obfuscate that that would be where i would go with this but i guess in like a capitalist like neolib sense i can see why they would just go like nope fuck it and like start fresh like i could see like i understand why they're doing what they're doing but i don't agree with it but all the the gen x cringe goths uh need to stop being cringe as well <laughs> can you impale me please please impale me What's that from? What? It's from uh, Preserving Worlds. I didn't get to use it. No, oh, I was like, is this some new anime you're watching? 
No. I'm a bad doggy. And- <laughs> <laughs> Is it Catherine Hepburn time now? Yeah. So that was. <laughs> All right, closing All right. out that. We're not goths anymore. All right, and now get your cardigans. Yes, now we are. Oh my god, I got like a fifties, a cheeky little like Doris Day. I am a rabbit. Yeah, that works. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a movie about bunnies. It's true. Her name is Bunny Watson, which yeah. is a tight name. That's good. Yeah, bunny, of course, being a shortening of the name rabbit. <laughs> so I've never seen this movie. And no one told me it was good. I just thought it was like, <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah, Everyone no, was just um, like it's the movie people see, but it's yeah, like in, in in when I was in grad school, like last day of one of my classes, we watched um like a few scenes of this one. We didn't watch the whole thing because we wouldn't have had time. It's almost two hours long, but um we watched a couple clips of it, and I was like, this shit rules because Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, baby, it's a Tracy Hepburn joint. Like, come on, it's always gonna slap when you got Tracy and Hepburn together. They were married. <laughs> And it's like probably a lavender marriage because, you know, Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy. <laughs> but they were they weren't married. Yes, they were. No, they were together no. for a really long time. But he was actually married until his death to a completely other woman. Oh, I was that's just, right. I was she, just she, reading. She, the they whole, were having an affair. That's right. Yeah. Still. I, sorry, I, I stayed up until past midnight reading the art, reading the Wikipedia <laughs> article about Catherine Hepburn. So <laughs> she's great. I love her. She's it's a little misogynist, my, but, you know. She made, she wore some really great pants and that makes up for it a little bit. <laughs> mm. I prefer her stuff with Cary Grant, but it's my own personal thing. Bringing up baby. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> I own the criteria to bring up baby. <laughs> I, I had actually never seen any Catherine Hepburn movies until I got with wife and they were like, I can't believe you haven't seen bringing up baby and Philadelphia story. The, I think are the ones. Philadelphia yeah. story is the most romantic movie that's ever been made. Like, hey, oh. Yeah. They're also really good at the what is it the transatlantic accent like. <laughs> well, right, y'all, aren't we? <laughs> busts that out when they like want to freak me out for a second. I'm like, who did you become? <laughs> <laughs> the leopard. What is I? What if Carrie uh, Grant were in this? It would have made it ten times better. That's true of every movie. Yeah, I uh, I knew Spencer Tracy. He's in one of my other favorite movies. Yeah. Um, the one about the um, teaching evolution in school. He's a lawyer representing the, the teacher. Yes, yeah, Mr. Chase, he's great. And they do the Southern gentleman lawyer stuff. It's real fun. Yeah. They're, they're hamming it up, getting oh, out yeah. the suspenders. Spencer Tracy, baby. So this movie came out in 1957. It Ahead is. Of the time. Yeah, it's about NBC, but they don't say it's NBC. Uh, it's a big commercial for IBM. <laughs> yeah, the movie's a big commercial for IBM. So the it's about a corporate reference department library that is mainly for trivia. <laughs> yeah, they answer the same question a lot. I actually had a boss who worked in a newsroom library, corporate librarianship for a long time in New York. Yeah. I kind of wanted to like call her up and be like, Did you ever see Desks Up? <laughs> is that you? <laughs> she she very much has the vibe. So I love how gossipy they were. They were so catty. Yeah. I no, this movie <laughs> this movie's very fun. Everyone it seems like some some scenes were almost improv where they're just like goofing around. Everyone in this movie fucks. Yes, everyone they in this movie fucks. They say sexy at one point. Like he call like the one dude calls Catherine Hepburn sexy at one point. I was like, what year is Gasp. Nineteen fifty seven. And there the uh uh Spencer Tracy is a Oh, what was it? A methods engineer or efficiency, efficiency, expert? efficiency expert? Yeah. Fucking class. And so, <laughs> yeah. So his job is to to computerize things. And this is the 1950s. So it's uh, literally when IBM is just switching from government contracts to commercial contracts. So they're making uh, the Mark III and selling it to various companies. I think they're maybe they're making something small. I don't know. I was I was. I was brushing up on my history of this because this is some stuff I had you I learned in like library school, like a uh, Univac and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, which I think is probably most people's frame of reference because Univac was like a big deal when the Census Bureau bought, uh, Census bought one uh, in 1951 for like a million dollars. That's a lot. 1951, probably. So he's hanging out to learn how the library works so that he can build a computer that will magically like digest books. I don't it's not explained how. Don't worry about it. It's AI. 
yeah, it's it's, it's Chat GPT. You could just yeah. do this with Chat GPT, and it's like, literally. yeah, it, it literally just would be the same movie. Yeah, and I'm, I will talk about that at the end. But oh, yeah, the the librarians are all fun. Everyone's getting smacked on the ass. Uh, several ass smacks for the girls. Getting drunk at work on champagne. Very drunk. They're drinking for hours. I'm yeah. proud of them. <laughs> Through three bottles of champagne in that same afternoon. It's a lot. Good for them. But anyway, Bunny is dating her boss and he's a pain in the ass. We're not supposed to like him from the beginning. He's been leading her on for six, seven years. And uh, so Spencer Tracy's character is a lot more fun. But he uh, starts off by taking her up on the roof in like winter and then grilling her. And turns out she has like a mind palace like Sherlock. He like negs her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's like, like, like now a- this one's going to be tricky. He's like a pickup artist. He's like nagging her. And they're really into like, like the way that her like, it's like, oh, her magic librarian powers are like that. She like automatically counts how long words are and then uses that number to like make other connections for like the answer and stuff. She does a bunch of like cool librarian numerology. I think I, she's neurodivergent. <laughs> like, yeah. She knows a lot about trains. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I re- or what was the I associate a lot of things with a lot of other things. I think she yeah. says something like that like three times in the movie, and I'm like, okay, so like uh-huh. you have a special interest. Yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I kind of wanted to get a clip because uh, it's supposed to be because like her teeth are chattering, but the way she's answering like the questions uh, is like, uh, so the first one is a mathematical question. Oh, do you want celery and olives? Uh, uh, celery and olives. And she goes, three celery, four olives. And he goes, that's not the question. She goes, oh, but it's like not a joke. <laughs> See, I just thought it was a very dry joke because I laughed, but. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I mean, you probably Catherine was. Catherine Hepburn's but... delivery is like spot fucking on. She's so good. And they play so well off each other. It's so obvious that they're fucking in real life. It makes it really good to watch them together. I I, yeah. I really appreciated how they're both just utterly fucking oddballs. It's so good. And like it's that's that's why they like worked and like why they got each other, which like I was just like, yes, show me the older oddballs falling in love in their like fifties, please. Like I was really like because the young boss is like think he's like younger than she is which like you call her <laughs> yeah and like she turns around and chooses like the the older man and the yeah no i just i was just like this is kind this is of progressive in that sense for this for the 1950s like this is like kind of a feminist film in a yeah. very basic kind of reductionist feminist sense but like in multiple ways yeah because i mean yeah. it's definitely about like every woman none of the women are married and there are there's only one who's really like obviously younger they all have like dedicated careers they're all you know when they think they're fired they're all like well we're gonna get new jobs obviously so it'll be a shame we can't work together but like you know we're all gonna yeah. obviously be on the job market i don't like cats i like men was a great line <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> talking about them moving in together when they're old spinsters. If it, if she doesn't get married, then we can get a cat. I don't like cats. I like men. <laughs> and so do you. <laughs> and so do mm-hmm. you. You don't like pussy. I love that character. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. You like men. <laughs> yeah, she was the best. Yeah. Uh, you don't see any women in senior admin, obviously. It's still the 50s. But yeah, it is like subversive in, in certain ways. She finally gets... Uh, proposed to and turns it down because she doesn't want to leave her job Mm -hmm. so she's like i'm not you know she's not gonna upset her whole life and it wasn't even just like her job it was like she also felt connection to the people she worked with Mm -hmm. and that could be read as some like you know uh, vocational awe like stuff but it could also be shown as like workplace solidarity right like you don't just abandon like you can also you can obviously leave your job at any time you do not owe it to your job to do anything but like she was talking about like her connection to the people she worked with as like the really important thing like the the girls like it wasn't Mm -hmm. the boss or anything like she cared about the her the people she directly worked with every day i was like yeah you should unionize (laughs) you should unionize (laughs) that that scene kind of like and i i just watched the end of it because i fell asleep last night and couldn't finish it but uh like that whole scene just made me go oh he never realized she was autistic like 
you know, because like he comes in and he's like, I got promoted, you know, to vice president of the West Coast. So we're moving out to California next Tuesday. We'll get married. We'll have our own house, you know, which all of this stuff, which usually sound great. And she very obviously, at least to me, is like, we were going to get married and not have children. And I wasn't going to have to be like a corporate like housewife. I was going to keep my job because we both work here. Like I, to me, it was like and very obvious, she- like not what she had planned at all. And she had just realized that she had already pre-constructed it all in her brain and never actually said any of that out loud to him because he never actually showed any commitment before that point. So, Right, because yeah. she had talked about like – what about this? What about like earlier in the film? She'd be like, but what about housing? What about kids? And he's like, oh, people in love, they don't care about that. They don't plan about that. Like he was originally writing off any sort of planning. And then yeah. all of a sudden he just springs this on her. She's like, wait, no, <laughs> but the planning. Oh, where you're going to live and the job you work and how you make your money and your independence, those things don't actually matter when you're getting married. I was like, I don't think you know this woman at all, bruh. Bruh. <laughs> I loved her giant plant that she was worried about when she got fired. Like, what am I going to do with my philodendron? <laughs> it's giant. Take it on the bus. Yeah. Pay an extra fare because it's alive. The Lexington Avenue bus. A lot of this movie is like a rom-com. There's a, a caught in the rain scene with her and Spencer Tracy. And they have to go into her apartment where he puts his shoes in the oven and forgets for, about his shoes in the oven. For and then no very good reason. Eats them. <laughs> And then her her boyfriend comes back because uh, his flight gets canceled and then he has the soul. But uh, Spencer Tracy's just loving it. He's just like sitting there like, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, it's perfectly. Uh, it's like, yeah, you should call ahead next time. <laughs> yeah, he's just he, he's like this in like a, the other movie that I like. Uh, he, he's just like, oh, don't worry about me. I'm just going to sit here and eat fried chicken. I think yeah. he does that in that movie, too. <laughs> yeah. No, he's hey. like, Is there, I'm going to go get I'm going to go get like dessert. Like. Y'all can have your lover spat. I'm going to go get dessert out of your freezer wearing the embroidered bathrobe that you got. <laughs> for your point. By what the way, your floating you're, island. You're, by the way, your kitchen's almost on fire. You need a new <laughs> like w- ventilator. And it's like, no, your shoes are in there, bra. Are you just walking around barefoot. This was a fun movie. <laughs> it's so good. It's so weird. Yeah. It's like really weird. Yeah. This is a good like era of movies where there's like, there's a conservatism to some movies, but there's also a lot of like movies that are just kind of going for it politically in a lot of ways. But I mean, this movie is again, like we said, like a big popularization. There's actually an article that I had in the notes, imagining information retrieval in the library. And that kind of talks about how people in the popular media saw computers and oh, was it cybernetics, the interplay of humans and machines. And it was sort of a big pitch. That's not what of, cybernetics is. Yeah. Well, whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. Cybernetics is like systems theory, like feedback loops and stuff. It's like predates computers. It was. Yeah, I can't remember. I don't have the, I don't have the article open because I rebooted my computer. Uh, popular ideas about computers and are they going to take jobs or are we going to interact with them in different ways? Are they going to free up labor? And that was kind of the whole sales pitch for IBM at the point at that point in the 50s. Yeah. And that's what this movie is about. This is about like automation versus should we be Luddites, basically? Yeah. Like, when do we smash the looms and when do we uh, accept automation? And there's kind of a, a point in the movie that I didn't really get at the beginning. I, I kind of rewatched the beginning of the movie to catch it. But the whole reason Spencer Tracy's character is not giving them information about their job security is because there's a merger coming up with another network and he and the whole thing they're saying don't tell them about is the merger because they don't want the stock for the other company to go up while the merger is happening so he's not allowed to tell them that their jobs are actually safe once the merger happens they're actually going to expand the department he kind of has to let miscommunications happen and let them get mad at him because he's not allowed to say because he's explicitly told he can't say anything to them about the thing so you have to go back and watch the beginning again to catch that i really like how they just like hand waved the whole coding of the machine thing like yeah oh, yeah <laughs> we fed it all of the information that's in this reference department and i'm just like and how many man hours did that take and who was the one punching those cards so you could feed it into this machine because like yeah like did you get the chick from nasa to do that for you <laughs> yeah it's just kind of cracking up like this is hamlet and i'm like is it though is like, it like it's like it's like 
30 scantrons. Yeah, it's like, like it's been two happening. weeks. How did you get this whole ass department into this machine in two weeks? Like, unless. And it does voice to text. And Marak is very smart. Yeah. A thinking computer, a learning machine, An electronic brain. It was giant brains is kind of the apparently like a real phrase that was used around that time. It's giant brains. And I found it interesting that they kept calling it a she and Mm -hmm. it's like a a servant machine. And it's like feminized in the way that Siri, unless you go into the settings and change it, has a female voice. And Alexa has a female voice. And Cortana is a wife. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> like like we we, yeah. we we code quote like servant uh technology as uh feminine yeah what if you could fuck when you could get the nurturing that you never got from your mother via i mean it's basically a love triangle between not just her and the two dudes but her spencer tracy and the machine because at the end she's like you love that machine more than i do more than you love me like that will always come first And he's like, bullshit. And then she's like, what if I destroy it right now? And he's like, fine, do it. And then she smashes the fucking looms. And he's like, see, it's fine. I twitch. Okay, it'll just take me a second to fix it, though. (laughs) Like, (laughs) like, she's right. Like, this feminine coded machine is also, quote, a threat to their relationship. And he, yeah. I was gonna say, I liked the moment where he like the the uh, machine, the Emirac down in payroll fucked up and sent everybody pink slip pink slips. And he, he goes, well, I better go down there and see like what payroll's up to like, go fix that machine. And as he's leaving, he sees the boyfriend stroll back in carrying, carrying roses and stands there in the hallway. And you could just see it on his face. Do I, do I go take care of this other machine? Or do I go back in there and sabotage his shit like I have been doing this whole movie? And he goes, I'm going to go sabotage his shit. And I'm like, yes, choose the woman. <laughs> the machine will still be there. But yeah, I was just like, this is going to come up later, I can tell. Smash the looms for love. Smash and the Smithers love. is waiting outside watching. Smithers. <laughs> Smithers. Sorry. Mother. Oh, mother. When they that kind Smithers, of characters, I was like, I wonder. If Smithers mm. was named after this character. I think IBM's Watson is named after Der, this character. After Bunny, yeah. 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 And not just Watson, like, from Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Which I'm assuming she's named after. Maybe. I'm actually reading a book right now for Left Page called Homo Deus. It was written in 2015. Mm-hmm. It's a pop history book. It's really bad. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I, I've, I've heard tell about this. Yeah. And when I brought up Cortana... Uh, that reminded me um, in the book, it, he's like, Microsoft is making an AI called Cortana. And what if you could talk to Windows and it'll know your appointments and it'll know your schedule and it'll answer your emails for you. And it took like five years after that before even it got the auto suggesting outlook that's like follow up with this person like oh yeah thank you which is a great feature by the yeah, way that's the only good feature they've rolled out the rest the of this rules. spyware shit how many emails did you send this week fuck you turn that off <laughs> <laughs> but the hey maybe follow up with this person i'm like you're right i should <laughs> yeah those are good did, you, did y'all know that in teams you can turn on like a speaker what god what is it like a speaking ad- advisor that'll tell you how many ums and ahs you utter when you talk and like all of this stuff and i'm like why Kill would you do that fire. to yourself Kill like, it. smash it yeah i mean if you, if you just just record yourself talking you'll you'll fix how you talk <laughs> That's all you got to do. I did this with a tape recorder when I was like 11. I was Start like, that's what I sound like. Yeah. Yeah. When you realize what your your ticks are. Mine is and whatnot, by the way. <laughs> mm. I've learned. Mine is ending sentences with, uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> not continuing. I was, yeah, constantly starting sentences with so. I, I develop new ones over time. Mm-hmm. And I catch them. But the, that Homo Deus book is very much like scaremongering about AI. And part of what, what I'm tying that book into is what's been going on recently in the past few months of like the AI scaremongering industry, mm-hmm. which is very much like, AI is a bigger threat than nukes. And it's like, how? It's like, well, they could make us fire nukes. I'm like, then it's not a bigger threat than nukes, is it? 
And so the whole thing is about the fucking basilisk isn't real. <laughs> like, yeah, t- terrifying pe- the the governments of the world into letting them write their own regulations that would say you have to give people a license to do AI and you should give it to us five companies. <laughs> and uh, it's a good strategy because it's cheap. Um, you don't have to buy off people to do regulatory capture. But that's it's kind of the consensus is like, this is just regulatory capture. It's just people trying to get you freaked out about chat GPT so they can write some laws that protect their industries. Yeah, like my um, my one of my fall, I think in August, jobs I have like projects I have to do at work. Um, and so researching it over the summer is um, helping my institution like um, develop a, a policy around AI because students are starting to use it to submit things and getting caught. Um, but then also some faculty are encouraging students to use it for certain types of assignments. And in those instances, they're actually good uses of it, I will say. It's like there's a whole lot of like, my task is to just be like, okay, here's what's actually AI and it's not scary. And so here's what you need to know about it. Okay, now you can make informed decisions. Here's also like the political and labor context around AI that should help inform the decisions you make about whether or not to tell students to use it or to accept work made using it or et cetera, et cetera. Like, I, I feel like a, a lot of our like, whether you are pro or anti or neutral AI, I feel like a important step we should all be taking. And I feel like this movie is kind of like a good example of that is just like showing that it's really not as scary or smart as people are making it out to be. Show the flaws in the system, fuck with it, sabotage it a bit, and then show where it's actually useful. And then you can like go from there. Um, like at the end part of her sabotage is like trolling it so that it spits out like a million stands a long poem that she knows by heart and is reciting along with it. And I was like, queen, you go, Catherine. It's in her mind palace. It's in her mind palace. Exactly. Uh, because she's just Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. She's BBC Sherlock. Yes. But way better. The show sucks. But yeah. like she like shows the, the flaw in the machine. And then at the end actually does use it to ask a question, which is where the advertisement, the commercial of this movie is, is her, the big skeptical one actually using it. And, um, it actually asking her a follow-up question. It does a reference interview on her. And then she's like, good girl. And then that's the glowing endorsement of, of the machine is that she asks it, well, how much does the earth weigh? And it asks her with or without people on it, which a machine would never ask because it wouldn't know to ask that, right? And they would have had to feed it the data. Exactly. Um, so it would just spit out whatever data it had. Yeah. Yeah. So that sort of, I feel like this movie is like a good way to approach AI is showing just really that this is just statistics <laughs> is, is really what machine learning and language models and whatnot is. It's just statistics. It's just ones and zeros. Yeah. And there are genuine uses for it. And also there are political decisions we should be making about those legitimate uses. Like, okay, if there are legitimate uses, do we then still do we use them or do we choose not to use them and smash the mills or looms or whatever it is that the Luddites did because it was like not that the tech itself was bad but that it was going to be weaponized against them as an active threat to their employment which also we see in the film we think is happening because they all get fired and then the one lady whose job it is to do the prompts basically uh is the only one not fired yeah Pre-merge. She she also knows, I think she knows about the merger. So she knows they're not getting fired. And then yeah. she's confused why they're making her answer the phone. A thing she can't do because she's got phone anxiety in the 50s. Don't be a reference librarian if you have phone anxiety. I can't answer the phone. I have misophonia in the 50s. I have 50s misophonia. <laughs> she's also a huge jerk to them when she first beats them. But they are all very drunk also. And they're also so. very catty and gossipy. <laughs> They are great, and it's an awful work environment. <laughs> I was going to say, also, they do have a union. There is a line where uh, oh, they say, they can the, yeah, can the machine replace us? And it says, oh, yeah, she's down at the union office asking already. I missed that line. We um, stand a unionized library workforce. Bam, 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 bam. Because, yeah, they're, they're communications workers, so CWA probably. Now, are they librarians? Yeah, corporate librarians. Okay, I didn't know if we had gotten like confirmation as to like what their job title. I don't think it's in their job titles, but 
or I, or if they're called librarians or cuz they or if they're like researchers but i mean they're called reference yeah they i think they're called reference and research interchangeably yeah so i wasn't sure if this was explicit like these are reference librarians or but she did say she went to library school did which she? Was like, i missed that too okay which was like a <laughs> summer course back then so. i i must have missed everything um Okay. It was early in the movie. It was um. It was when they were talking in the lobby before they do the grilling test. Because that's like another thing I think is really valuable about this film is showing just how much reference services have changed. Like, what is the point of reference librarianship? And because like this it is people calling and asking trivia questions, and then they off the top of their head or very quickly can give them the answer to trivia questions that sound stuff like- you would Google. Yeah, like, did search engines change? Because it's like now, unless a woman's in a hurry, or if it like really wasn't worth me showing them how to do it, I would never just tell someone, like, I wouldn't be, one, I wouldn't be asked trivia questions, but also I wouldn't just tell someone something. I would usually, if it's a reference question, walk them through how to find that information themselves, teach them how to use the interfaces like show them my thought process, like see where their thought process is so that they can do it without me. Right. Um, Like that's how I was taught, like in my reference class in grad school, like this is how you do the reference interview. This is what your role as a reference librarian is at the university of Illinois. Like the grad assistants there, like you like go through like a fucking, like almost like a boot camp a week before, like you even start library school. If you were going to work at a reference desk there where you were just grilled on all of the different reference interview stuff and you practice and you practice and you practice. And it's like, you never just answer someone's question ever. It's always, you walk them through how to do it. And you ask all these, like the, it was seriously, before I even was in my reference class, um, they were like, you are not allowed to sit at this reference desk if you don't know how to do this. And so it was just like fascinating to see reference librarians just answering trivia questions. <laughs> So I just didn't know when that switch happened. And then one of the other articles that you had us read, Justin, um, like talked about sort of like, is this change good or not? Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. The other one, I didn't have a chance to go back over. Um, So I mostly did the one about the movie. The modern corporate librarian would probably be like digital asset management. Because yeah, it'd after, be like Luis's job. Yeah. After, after computerization in the 90s, organizations generate so much information that they need someone to actually sort it. So that's where DAM comes in and metadata. So it's not so much you need to build a reference library. You need to build a database of your own assets because you've got so much stuff. Yeah. Or it'd be like if it's as like a newsroom, it would be like all of the like research assistant interns. Yeah. I mean, those jobs all kind of went away from what I understand is that yeah. The, these jobs don't exist anymore in this movie, but they didn't go away till relatively, relatively recently. Like I'd say the last 20 ish years, 30 yeah. years. So it took a while. Um, and I think mostly that was uh, that change wasn't really the Internet. It was probably like changes in media landscape and the 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, like it was probably cable killed it. <laughs> really? I mean, because like news changed to opinion and talk radio kind of stuff. News that happened today. Yeah. And also the proliferation of uh, like local stuff that's all syndicated, their main content. So, Mm. yeah, I guess that's probably that would be the industry stuff. I don't know. I've always been interested in corporate librarianship. I was I I did want to I think I did apply for a corporate librarianship job one time. Oh, I was straight up like one of my my mentors was like, get get a cushy, you know, corporate librarian job with like Amazon or something and pay off your student loans in like two years. I was like, oh. And I did not do that. Um, I don't know how many of them even pay that good. It, you know, exaggerating hyperbole, but yeah, you know, the whole if I removed meta from my metadata title, I'd be making like a bajillion dollars, you know, when I had metadata in my title. Mm hmm. I haven't seen that many corporate jobs, but I haven't really been looking either. I don't really see them. I remember when like Netflix would post a like metadata job that everyone would like go ham about it. Or like I remember um, the person who taught the taxonomy or like the the thesaurus building class, the thesaurus construction class at U of I, um, the adjunct who did that was the taxonomist for Etsy. Yeah. No, there's definitely some people um, whose 
I think there's like publisher jobs and stuff that hire librarians. Mm-hmm. And there was that part-time gig that I applied for. It's like, uh, I mean, it was to do metadata for like OER or open publishing or something. It might have been for Thoth or something like that. Oh, I did have a note that her apartment's huge. Yeah. If it's supposed to be a New York City apartment. I mean, which I think it is that that great like phallic establishing shot at the beginning of the skyscraper they work in. Yeah, I don't think it was supposed to be Chicago or anything. Oh, you wanted to talk about librarians on Jeopardy. Yeah. So what this was reminding me of the whole time was the whole like because they're all the the librarians in this. um, They're not really shown to be actually looking things up a lot of the time. They just know shit, right? They just know things at the top of their head. She has her little mind palace. And what cued me to write that in the notes of we can we please talk about librarians on Jeopardy is one of the other librarians. And like when Catherine Hepburn's character said that she has a bad memory, um, I wrote the exact quote down was um, you chose to go into reference work with a bad memory as in like the whole like idea that people have that librarians just know everything, right? Which we don't. But there's the whole, like, I do know how many librarians I know who, like, um, have, like, I I went to grad school with someone who got on Jeopardy. There was that one librarian recently who got on Jeopardy. Like, there's been, like, a couple librarians on Jeopardy. But there's this whole, like, you know, people think librarians know everything. And I feel like a lot of required advocacy for what our roles are and what we do should be to dispel that actually to be like no it's not that i know everything it's that i have the skills to find things and i can i have the skills to teach you those skills on how to find things right um but then you still get the like a million librarians on jeopardy thing where it's like oh that's the perfect person to be on jeopardy right a librarian because librarians know everything it's like librarians as encyclopedia a lot of us are just neurodivergent (laughs) (laughs) a lot of us just really like trains okay yeah guys (laughs) have you thought of that i watch a lot of trivia shows yeah i was in scholar bowl in high school like scholastic bowl i was like the captain we won a lot because i do know (laughs) trivia Jay, are you a nerd? Yeah, I don't know. Like that that was just like how this movie was portraying librarians as the like they didn't even need to look things up, they just knew it. All right, because they had memorized it. They knew all this trivia. And and the fact that, oh, well, my memory is bad. Oh, you, you went into reference work and you don't know everything and you're not on, on Jeopardy? How dare you? What I really would have liked to see is not just that they like knew everything, but like that they knew who their users were. Yeah. Like we don't know any like, of these people asking questions. Yeah, well, and at, at one point when like the, the machine is like trying to answer the question and is spitting out the like 80 stanza poem or whatever. And she's like, well, I, that's not going to be the correct answer. Like it's going to give you a review for this movie instead of the actual answer that you're going for. Like, Instead of just being like, oh, well, I know where that answer is. I'm going to go find it immediately because I know exactly where it is or I already know it. Like, be like, oh, well, that's, you know, Betty from blah, blah, blah. And she's doing a segment on this. And that wouldn't have made any sense. So let's try over here. Or, you know, like more of a like, I would have much rather seen like them knowing the kinds of things that the people that they're helping are up to. And they're really bad at the gives- reference interview, actually. Yeah. And yeah, like- that they don't do it. <laughs> And that's what gives them the advantage over the machine just spitting out facts is like they actually like have an actual human element to it instead of just being like the walking encyclopedia. And she's like, let's show them how humans do it, girls. And then they just march off to like find the facts. And I'm like, I they don't really show the human element. They really don't show the human element. <laughs> they just pick up the phone and like, oh, question. I know the answer. Beep. And then that's like they don't do the reference. <laughs> And like that's probably part of the whole screwball comedy of it. Like, right? Yeah, like it's is, funny. It's funny, but like in I love the of, poison one. Yeah, <laughs> where it's like someone calls the ass, and they're like, "Yeah, there's these poisons that are undetectable, but we are not allowed to say them on air <laughs> or something." And I was like, "That's cute." <laughs> I don't know, like librarians as like walking trivia, and they're also like gossipy. Like it, it felt like very of that's those are the same thing, right? The gossip, the knowing everything, the astrology gets brought up a lot in this. I mean, it was hip at the time to do astrology stuff. Yeah, I think I covered all my major points about like AI um, and the scaremongering stuff, which is what I wanted to like close on. But 
yeah, the punch cards and like the merger of library and information science is already kind of happening before World War II. And like computer science as well. Yeah, it was, I mean, it, it took off into a different field, but before that, mm-hmm. there was a lot of like taxonomy that was just like, we'll do taxonomy of everything. And a lot of that actually got destroyed during World War II and got set back and then computer science took off and caused a little split. But also it's a a lot of the, the computing in this movie couldn't actually do anything that they wanted it to do. So that's why computing and libraries took another couple decades to really take off because these computers are huge and Slow. Slow and coding information takes time. Yeah, is the Bitcoin. You know, it's it's too slow to actually be usable for what it was initially meant to be used for. Which was yeah. like, you know, buying a pizza would take like two hours. That doesn't work, right? Yeah, unless you centralize it. Yeah, which defeats the purpose of it. Basically. Uh, yeah, so it's similar similar thing like it's creating a solution to a problem that wasn't really there and then it just creates more problems yeah yeah like there's a way to do automation i think automation has its place in library science right there's so much you know how much time is fucking wasted it's like just keeping the oclc like records in koha up to date because that's not an automatic sync that happens and our records are old and bad. And so they don't just like match when I batch upload them. And so I have to do a lot of manual matching. How you know much time that fucking takes me? And I normally make my student workers do it, uh, but I don't have them in the summer. So then I have to do it. You know how much time that fucking takes? It takes a long time. What if that were automated? That'd be great. I would love that. Because then I could do more important things like writing documentation and making like instruction videos and, you know, doing my job. That 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 would be good, you know, but... No, that's not what gets automated. Not without switching ILSs, you know? Yeah, I think the main possibility of like AI will be, it probably won't even be like chat GPT stuff. It'll be the underlying technology like that builds, I don't remember what they're called, but there's a word for like the nodes, the statistical nodes that take information and make it like, okay, these clump together because like there's an 87% chance like this is the next word. And it creates like like these maps, but they're called like mat, like mats, like M-A-T-T-E-S or something like that. Oh, okay. It's some kind of like linked data, but it's all automatically generated. So you just run it through a computer and it makes like these... Like topic modeling? I think it's like that, but it's it's got another term. Because oh, someone okay. was talking about... Um, oh, cool. That is really neat. They were feeding all the data of, of archive.org into one of these uh, maps. And they were like, oh, yeah, we could just automate libraries, man. And everyone was like, just dragged him because he was like 20 years old and an idiot. And um, and he's like, OK, yeah, it would take a lot of time to put new information in there. But it's like it's the same simple problem. It's like, no, it's not because also it's who's going to encode the data. Like it can be done statistically, but it's like these PDFs aren't always readable or, you know, there's all kinds of problems if they're retracted, stuff like that. But, yeah, he was explaining how the, the generation is actually done. He's like, yeah, that doesn't take any time at all. It's just computing power issues. But you probably will see this first in like legal applications mm. uh, where they'll just build citation trackers and then that way corporate lawyers can have them and your public defender won't have it so they can look up more precedent than your lawyer can. And that's kind of like already how the tiered systems of like Lexus Nexus already work. Yeah. So that's why I, I imagine seeing like useful. But if you use Chat GPT, it would just like make up precedent because yeah. it hallucinates. So. Yeah, because it's just about prediction of like what fits the pattern and not actually what's factually correct. Yeah, it's trained to not cite its sources. Mm-hmm. And also a lot of data is proprietary. Mm-hmm. Which is bad. Yeah, it means also that it's not going to be able to build like a legal database because that's all owned by LexisNexis and Westlaw. Yeah, fuck LexisNexis. <laughs> Yeah, listen to our in a, uh, episode on data cartels. Yep. All right. Arthur said good night. He looked at the he looked at the computer. That means he said good night. Okay. Good night. <laughs>